Last year when Toyota announced that we were finally getting the crown in the United States, a lot of folks were asking, are we gonna get the other crowns? Because there isn't just one around the world, there are several, and the answer is yes, this is the new Crown Signia. This is effectively gonna replace the Toyota Venza in the lineup, and you can think of this as wagon meets crossover meets SUV, definitely premium Subaru Outback vibes as far as the profile. But Toyota has said that this is competing in perhaps a slightly different segment. Segment. We don't know pricing details for the new Signia yet, but you can expect that this is gonna be more along the lines of the Honda Passport than the Subaru Outback. And I think that makes sense when you really come in close and take a look at the design. So let's start out with that. Obviously, we have a very style forward front end, definitely very different than the Crown sedan. The grille merges in there with the bumper. This is a trick that we've recently seen in the Lexus lineup. There are also some cooling slots right up there, radar sensor right at the top. And then very slim DRLs on top of these headlights that are pretty small and positioned lower on the bumper. Let me know what you think of that look. I am surprised that we didn't get more of a ring around the hood there kind of DRL. This is actually just a, a styling cutout right there in the hood rather than a separate lamp element. Now, as far as dimensions go, we don't have any official dimensions for the new Signia yet, but this is gonna be about the same size as the Crown Sedan. That makes sense because the Crown Sedan is on the large side for its segment, but you can tell we definitely have more crossover-like styling. Front doors forward, the structure of the vehicle is very, very similar. We have 235, 45 R21s there, so pretty big tires. We don't know ground clearance figures just yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and guess maybe somewhere between six and a half and seven inches. One big advantage to this format of vehicle, the wagon style format, is the low roof line. So if you wanna put bicycles or kayaks or things like that on top of your vehicle, you don't have as far to lift them. And we are gonna find these roof rails on most models, it appears. Obviously, cross members are gonna be optional. But because we have that high riding design of the vehicle, the seating position on the inside is a bit more similar to some crossovers. So you get that more commanding view of the road, you get that crossover feel, but you can also opt for more of a relaxed seating position, more sedan-like, if you'd rather have that as well. Now, coming around to the back, Obviously, this is gonna be a two-row vehicle. Let me know what you think of the styling of the Signia. I think it's a little bit less adventurous, shall we say, versus the Crown Sedan. We have this sort of two-tiered style to the hatch. Spoiler right there with the third brake light integrated inside of it. And lots and lots of storage space back here. That's definitely one of the big advantages to this boxier hatch format. We don't have official cargo area figures just yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if this was somewhere around 30 cubic feet, perhaps 35 cubic feet. Let's take a look under the floor. Go ahead and come in for a look here because we get some additional storage space and a place where you could actually put a spare tire. We don't know if one is gonna be included from the factory, but I suspect you could at least put one in there yourself aftermarket. This does appear to be a really practical storage area. Toyota would also like us to tell you that these rear seats not only fold down, but you can also flip these extensions over like this so that we can support longer cargo inside. To give you a better idea of exactly how big this is, you can put a six foot and a half item in here, apparently from the hatch all the way to the seat backs. Now, I was kind of hoping for maybe a seven foot item inside. We don't find fold flat front passenger seats in the Signia by all appearances. That could have helped improve cargo capacity just a little bit. Coming back to the rear for a moment, you can see we have full LED taillights back here, really slim designs, and then a light pipe that connects all the way from one side to the other. Very interestingly, even though this is gonna be a crown signia, all we get back here is the hybrid vehicle logo, the Beyond Zero logo, the all-wheel drive logo, crown, and then limited. It doesn't actually say signia anywhere. They want this to really highlight the crown sub-brand rather than the model specifically. All Signias will have one engine. This is Toyota's 2.5 liter four cylinder hybrid system, and it is their planetary power split system, not the new hybrid max system with the six speed automatic. So this is gonna be a lot smoother and more efficient. Power total comes in at 243 horsepower, so pretty similar to the tune that we find in the Highlander, not in the RAV4. So a little bit more oomph, pretty similar fuel economy to the Highlander as well. 36 miles per gallon combined, according to Toyota. That did surprise me a little bit. Obviously, this boxier format means that fuel economy is gonna drop a little bit behind the Crown sedan, but I hadn't expected it to be so close to that three-row Highlander. In the Toyota lineup, you really have a lot of options to choose from if you're interested in between 35 and 40 miles per gallon. This is now one of an increasing number of vehicles with this exact same hybrid system under the hood, and it has proven to be one of the most reliable drivetrains in America. 
All right, let's take a look inside. First, starting out with the seats. Again, the seating position is a bit of crossover meets sedan, just about exactly what you'd expect. But thanks to the tall roof line, you can get a very SUV-like seating position if you want, more of an upright seating position where your legs aren't stretched out in front of you. Interesting twist, the driver and front passenger seats don't have the same range of motion, even in this relatively top end trim here. We have a two-way adjustable lumbar support on the driver's side, no adjustable lumbar for the passenger side at all. Now, if I try and get this seat more into a Grand Highlander or Highlander kind of seating position, then my head is definitely touching the ceiling. So depending on the kind of seating position you're in, you might want to choose one or the other. Jumping into the back seat, the seating position is decidedly wagon-like. The seat bottom cushion is about the same height off the ground as the driver's seat, so none of that stadium seating that you might find in a boxier vehicle, but it's very comfortable, and it feels more interesting and more premium, I guess, than a two-row version of a Highlander would. Part of me is a little surprised they didn't just lop some inches off a Highlander and call it a Highlander Sport. Over here on this side, the front seat's all the way back in its tracks. So you can see I still have about uh, two and a half inches of legroom left there or so, and pretty decent headroom. If you come up here, you can see my hair is just barely brushing the ceiling. I can actually definitely stick a hand there, so pretty decent amount of room as far as that's concerned. The rear seats fold in a 60-40 fashion in addition to giving you that cargo flip and fold capability forward. You can also use this to just rest against the seat if you want those cargo items to not bop the seat, of course. That's kind of a handy touch. Uh, I'm not entirely clear why you would want to pop these little midsections out of this, though. Toyota hasn't really explained that. Maybe they will have that in some future announcement about exactly what that might be for. Now, headroom back here is probably going to be a little bit less limited if you can find a model without the panoramic moonroof. I, at this point, don't know whether this will be standard or not in this particular vehicle. If you didn't have it, I suspect you'd actually get about an extra inch or so. Taking a closer look at things in the back seat, we have two nice large air vents right here in the middle of everything, some USB-C charge ports, and a relatively slim hump in the middle. Remember, we don't have a drive shaft and we don't have a big transmission occupying space. So you will notice that the console that we're gonna take a look at in a bit is an awful lot slimmer than in the only other off-road wagon competitor. Now let's take a quick spin around the interior. Obviously, a lot is shared with the regular crown. If we come up here to the ceiling, you'll find the controls for the power moonroof. It's a two-pane moonroof, so we get a fairly small pane right here over the driver and front passenger's heads, and then we get that larger pane behind it. This has a powered shade, but the glass does not actually open, so if you want something that vents, you might want to look elsewhere. We get height-adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and the front passenger, and height-adjustable headrests as well. This interior is a very attractive sort of chestnut brown. We get perforated center sections of the seat, because these seats are both heated and ventilated, and some gold accents and gold piping there around the edges. Moving over to the front doors, we have lots of soft touch materials on the upper section of the door, but definitely harder plastics going on down there at the bottom. Let me know what you think of this two-tone color scheme. I have to say, I really am partial to a, a brown and charcoal interior like this. I think it's done really well. Also, the little accents like this floating section of the dashboard is nice, where we get that brown material behind it, really dresses things up there. And then we get color-coordinated trim here in the dashboard. It matches what's going on on the seats, and that C-shaped air vent there is pretty similar to what we find in the regular Crown. Now, in the middle of everything, we, of course, get the latest Toyota infotainment system. This is an approximately 12-inch LCD. It is a touchscreen, and, of course, it's going to support Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Below that, we have a very prominent physical volume button there. The controls for the automatic climate control, heated and ventilated seats as well, and then a fairly large center console. If I shine the light over here, you can see we have a Qi wireless charging mat, sort of a cup holder kind of thing there. Two USB ports right there in front of that divider. And then this divider functions as a cup holder and sort of a gadget holder as well. We have a joystick style shifter, pretty similar to what we find in other Toyotas at the moment. Drive is down there, sport down there. There's a drive mode toggle. We have an EV mode button. And then in this center console, we have a pretty decent amount of storage space. We find another USB port in there. That's the one that's going to interface with the system rather than just charge your device. We have basically the same key that we find in the rest of the Crown lineup. Only bearing in mind that this is a pre-production model. Apparently, it's for one of the minivans because it has a power hatch and power sliding doors. So, you know, keep that in mind. Moving back over here to the instrument cluster, we have the full LCD instrument cluster from the regular Crown. It is highly configurable, so if you want to check out that, you can check out the Crown video and see how that functions. We then have pretty much the typical Toyota steering wheel out here, paddle shifters on the back. Over here we have controls for that multifunction LCD, 
volume control right there, track forward, backward over here on this side, and then the controls for the standard radar adaptive cruise control on the right side of the steering wheel. If you're looking for a heads-up display, it doesn't appear that one will be offered, but I do think that this dashboard style is far more normative than what we find in the Prius or the BZ4X, and I actually really do like the way they've integrated this center channel speaker and that brown trim running right there across the center of the dashboard just behind the big LCD infotainment system. Something I noticed immediately here is that the footwell is decently wider than in the Subaru Outback. Because the Subaru's transmission would effectively be right there next to my right foot, we get considerably more room in this interior, as does the passenger. You can see that it doesn't flare out there in the passenger footwell. The passenger footwell actually gets wider at the end rather than narrower, and that's definitely going to be better for some taller folks. I also like the fact that this is all a soft touch material running across the dashboard, and they integrated that really well with this entire center console design. We already know that the new Signia is going to be on sale in the US next year. Unfortunately, I don't know how much it's going to cost. We also don't know some critical dimensions like what kind of off-road clearance we're going to get either. But we do know that it's going to be rated to tow 2,700 pounds. So if you want to tow a light trailer, you now have an additional option in Toyota's lineup. You don't have to step up to something even bigger and boxier like a Highlander to do that. Based on the crown makes a lot of sense. The interior, front, forward is shared, but I do think that the exterior is more handsome than the current crown sedan. The current crown sedan's front end, especially in the two-tone paint job that they have next to this in this tent, I think is just controversial just to be kind. Um, but this is much more handsome up front, and I'm really interested in this sedan meets crossover meets wagon format that they've decided to go with. My expectation is that pricing is probably going to start around forty-two dollars to $43,000. It's likely going to be more expensive than this very red crown sedan next to it. The drivetrains are effectively going to be shared between the two vehicles. We won't get the hybrid max system in the SUV version, but we will get that available in the crown sedan. But the base hybrid system is effectively shared between the two vehicles. We get 36 miles per gallon out of this, which is going to put this in an entirely different category than essentially everything else in this segment. Honda Passport, Atlas Cross Sport, etc. They're all going to be significantly less efficient than this. We do have the new upcoming Hyundai Santa Fe. It's obviously very different. It's much bigger and much boxier, but you will be able to buy a hybrid system in it. So I'm really going to be intrigued to see exactly what kind of customers gravitate towards this. Honestly, I think it's going to be people that have wanted something more premium from Subaru for a while, and Subaru is just not answering their call. I know a lot of folks that say I would buy another Subaru if it was just nicer inside, or if it was just more fuel efficient inside. Well, this is going to check all those boxes. The interior is certainly more premium than the Subaru Outback. It has more power under the hood than the Subaru Outback, as long as we're not talking about the turbo and significantly better fuel efficiency as well. So if you're looking for a big practical wagon to put all of your stuff in, take you further down that, uh, that road to the national park, then you definitely want to take a look at the new Crown Signia. Just keep in mind there's some details we don't know yet, but for all of that, stay tuned because hopefully we'll get you another video just as soon as possible when we can learn some more of those details, especially exact pricing and just how expensive the top-end Signia can get. See all of you next week.